For the next few minutes, I want to talk about some of the dynamics of applying the Gospels as Christian scripture and preaching and teaching the Gospels. First of all, the Gospels are narratives. That, that is, they come in story form. And that implies certain things about how we might most, most naturally apply them. Of course, I personally believe that the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. And so if the Holy Spirit uh, inspires you to apply the narratives in some way that is, is uh, different from would most naturally be the way, um, that's fine because the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sometimes we deceive ourselves as to what is the Holy Spirit and what is the burrito I had for, for lunch. And so um, th this is the tension between the freedom of the Spirit and wanting to have some accountability uh, to others, to the body of Christ, to other Christians, to the history of Christianity, and to the original meaning. And so that's that tension that we, we live in as, as Spirit-filled people, hopefully. Now, um, what is a narrative? Well, a narrative has three basic components events, characters, and settings. Events form the backbone of a plot. What happens after what? Uh, the characters are, of course, the people and the things that, that uh, are the, the, um, the players uh, in those events. Now, a character doesn't have to be a person. A donkey is a character in the book of Numbers. Uh, a computer could be a player. Um, and, and so, uh, a character doesn't have to be a person. But as characters uh, interact with each other in events, that forms a plot. And of course, um, these things take place in various settings. Events take place in settings in space. They take place in settings in time. And of course, there are sociocultural settings. Uh, there are ideological uh, settings. But these three elements, events, characters, and settings, come together to form plot uh, in a story or a narrative. And, of course, these are told from a certain point of view. This is very uh, important. Uh, even in history, there's no such thing as dispassionate history. Telling history requires selecting certain events as important um, and, and uh, deselecting other things. Uh, and so um, no story is told from a God's eye point of view uh, because all human telling of stories has to select uh, certain elements and prioritize and emphasize and of course there can be multiple multiple valid ways of telling a story uh, stories are arranged in various ways they can start in the middle of the story in medias race uh, they can start at the end and have flashbacks there's different ways to arrange it um, the the way that you arrange uh, story time uh, can be different from the actual uh, real time uh, the Gospel of Mark has been described as a, a passion narrative with an introduction, something like that. Uh, about a third of the Gospel of Mark is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. It, the story doesn't have to be told quite that way. Uh, and so uh, the way a story is arranged uh, says something about uh, the emphases and point of view of whoever is, is putting it together. So the Gospels are narratives, and, and that uh, that implies certain things about the most natural ways uh, to preach and to teach and to apply uh, the Gospels. Of course, uh, Gospel is not the original genre. Um, Christians created the genre we now call a Gospel. If someone had been walking in the library of ancient Alexandria and found the scroll of Mark, they wouldn't have said, oh, this is a gospel. I'm going to put it under B34. You know, um, of course, the, I don't know what the, the the classification of of scrolls was at Alexandria, um, but but gospel was not a genre. In fact, I can't prove it, but I wonder uh, if the gospel genre came about because of Mark 1:1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Originally, that meant the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. But maybe at some point. Uh, Christians began to think of a book like Mark as being a gospel. Uh, but but originally, um, it's generally agreed, there's not unanimous, but most, most experts would suggest that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are most similar to ancient biographies. Uh, that is, that if someone had picked up a scroll of Matthew uh, in the library of Alexandria, they would have assumed, oh, this is some sort of a bios, or a biography about someone named Jesus.
Uh, by contrast, Luke-Acts is usually considered some kind of a history. And of course, Luke-Acts go together. They are a, a single literary project, Volume 1, Volume 2. Um, in our current arrangement, from very early on, Luke and Acts got separated because all the, all the Gospels were put together. Uh, but of course that's somewhat artificial from a historical standpoint. Luke Acts go together um, and should be read together as a single um, uh, continuous narrative. That's not to say that there aren't um, uh, some minor um, differences between um, Luke and Acts, especially if you look at Luke 24 and then Acts 1, the, the perspective you'll get on the time between Jesus' resurrection and ascension is slightly different in Luke 24 than it is in Luke 1. But Luke and Acts are meant uh, to go together, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2. By calling them apologetic historiography, I don't, of course, mean that anybody's sorry that they wrote it. This is apologetic in the older sense of the word, that is, of a defense. And so um, I personally suspect that Luke Acts was meant, to some degree, to defend the character and virtue of early Christians. So those were the probably the way the genres of the Gospels would have been classified originally. Well, what does this tell us? I've generally been unimpressed that it tells us much of anything, um, knowing the genre. However, I do think there are some aspects of, of these genres in the ancient world that are worth noting and that may involve some paradigm shifts uh, for us. So, for example, ancient BOA or ancient biographies tended to focus on the character of a person. Um, they showed, uh, for example, if it was a good person, um, they, they presented that person as someone to be uh, em emulated and to be imitated. If it was a bad person, then they presented that person as, as somebody whose characteristics should be avoided. It's a little tricky with regard to Jesus because Jesus is the Son of God and none of us are. Uh, and so, um, you know, we can ask whether or not um, the character of Jesus is exactly the focus of the Gospels, but it's, it's at least something to keep in mind. Another interesting thing is, is that character in ancient ways of thinking was not seen as developmental, but as fixed pretty much from birth and even before birth. We, uh, what, even though uh, we sometimes make fun of Freud, we have all inherited Freud's developmental view of how people develop. It seems now commonsensical to us that if you if you if a person has certain characteristics as an adult um, now it may be just their genetics but but uh, we often ask questions like I wonder what happened to this person as a child to make them the way they are today that kind of question is a developmental question it's not the kind of question that the ancients asked or it's not the way ancients tended to view character Ancients tended to view a person's character as something that was fixed, even foretold. Um, a great person uh, might ha be expected to have had great omens uh, to have happened before that person was born. And, and when ancients looked at the childhood of a person, um, they expected there to be hints of the greatness that later showed up, or hints of the badness that later uh, showed up. And so it's not surprising that in the second century of, the, of this uh, Christian era, uh, that uh, there were some uh, stories that arose about Jesus' childhood, the infancy gospel of Thomas, the proto-evangelium of James, for example, where Jesus, uh, they, in, they invent stories of Jesus as a child. I personally don't think that they're complementary stories that, that they invented, um, but uh, presumably in the minds of the people who, who created the infancy gospel of Thomas, they were complimenting Jesus by showing him able to strike his teachers blind and that sort of that sort of thing. But but there was this sense in ancient biography that a person a person's character was fixed, faded, and that you would be able to see in a person's childhood reflections of what the person later became. An, an interesting difference with regard to historiography is that ancient history could entertain as well as tell history. Thucydides apologizes a little bit uh, for not being more entertaining. One wonders if he's being a little sarcastic about his predecessor Herodotus. But Thucydides uh, jokes a little, or, or, or comments that he's not uh, primarily aimed at, at entertainment when he writes his history. Uh, but even here, the standards of uh, what, for example, um, we would expect a historian today to double-check their sources to, to make absolutely sure that it happened and that it happened in exactly this way. I personally don't believe that that's the way ancient history worked. I believe that the focus was on the truth of the story more than on the precise historicity of the story. 
and that uh, there, there was uh, uh, often not a checking of sources. Of course, uh, in the case of Luke, Luke tells us that he uh, checked his sources. But even with Luke, I believe if you do a careful con comparison of Luke with Mark, which the overwhelming majority of scholars believe Luke used Mark as a starting point, um, one inevitably comes to the conclusion that even Luke has shown some creativity and artistry in the way that he's arranged and retold uh, certain events. So um, we shouldn't expect uh, that ancient historiographers uh, felt uh, compelled by uh, the standards of modern history writing, uh, and and that's okay. I mean, that's they're they're allowed to follow the standards uh, that they follow. Uh, we we are we are wrong if we insist on imposing our standard upon them. The ancient historian Thucydides again, although he he does largely try to stick to the facts, ma'am. Um, he, he tells in his introduction that he has composed some of the speeches in his history because he didn't have a source that told him about it. Well, this tells us that ancient historiographers felt free to compose speeches. And you, of course, have to form your own conclusion, but it would not be lying, therefore, and it would not be out of order. It certainly would not be an error, therefore, uh, if Luke had composed parts of the speeches and acts. You, again, you'll have to draw your conclusion. All I'm claiming is that by the standards of ancient history writing, that was perfectly uh, acceptable. Um, and so we have, to, we have to check our own biases at the door to some extent when we're dealing with um, uh, ancient historiography because they were following their standards, not um, what we insist are the right standards. Who says we're right? There are some special considerations. Uh, before we get into applying the gospel, some special considerations you, you should at least be aware of uh, as a minister, um, although you don't, again, you can do with them what you want. So the, the uh, perhaps, uh, dare, dare I say it is the unanimous consent of all experts of the gospels that there is a literary relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The overwhelming uh, majority uh, of experts on the gospels believe that Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their starting point. Um, the, the, um, the branch of New Testament studies that asks those sorts of questions is called source criticism. Criticism here doesn't mean cutting down the text. It's an older view uh, meaning for the word criticism that had to do with making critical judgments uh, with objectivity. And so source criticism simply means an objective view uh, uh, of attempt to be objective about the sources behind the Gospels. Of course, um, perhaps the majority still believe that Matthew and Luke then also used a so another saying source, uh, sometimes called Q uh, for short from the German Quelle, uh, which means source. Not all agree with that. Um, uh, for example, Mark Goodacre at Duke uh, believes that um, Matthew used Mark and then Luke used Mark and Matthew um, in the co composition of his gospel. Um, uh, that's source criticism. Of course, this, this implies that the attempt to harmonize the gospels is um, um, innocent and well-intentioned, uh, but misguided, uh, because you're trying to harmonize together sources that intentionally differ from each other. In other words, where, Mark, where Matthew differs from Mark, um, if, if Matthew's using Mark as a source, then we must conclude that Mark and Luke have deliberately varied the way they've told the story. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to correct the history. Again, that's a, a modern way of thinking. It may simply be that they wanted to present a different truth than Mark presents by varying the details. You know, to us, that's, that's anathema today. I believe that by ancient standards, that was perfectly appropriate. Form criticism... Um, uh, arose in the early 20th century. It deals with the way oral tradition is passed along. In my opinion, the earliest versions of form criticism were basically useless. Um, we've seen a much uh, better, um, uh, more sophisticated uh, treatments of oral tradition in recent decades. Um, I, I personally think, although I don't uh, think uh, all of Ken Bailey's work is to be trusted, um, uh, he gives some good fundamental insights about how oral tradition works, at least in the modern Middle East, how there is usually a kernel or a core of the story that is passed along fairly um, faithfully and um, uh, conti con uh, con continuously, but that the, ver the details around that core in oral tradition vary. Uh, so, you know, this, this would be exactly what we see in the Gospels, was one blind man, 
man? Was it two blind men? Was it going into Jericho? Was it coming out of Jericho? Those are the kinds of details um, that um, oral tradition tends to vary as a story is, is passed along. Um, more helpful is um, probably redaction criticism, which arose in the 70s. Redaction criticism basically said, instead of us trying to get beyond the Gospels, get behind the Gospels, get to the history or the historical Jesus or that sort of thing, instead of, instead of going back, why don't we look at the Gospels as we now have them and ask how the way that, for example, how has Mark used Matthew and how does that reflect Matthew's theology? For example, in Mark 7, uh, where Jesus is, is dealing with the whole question of whether what you eat makes you unclean, there's a parenthetical comment in Mark that says that by this comment Jesus declared all foods clean. When you look at that same passage in Matthew, Matthew has all the passage and everything, but when it gets to that declared all things clean, parentheses, it's not there. And so uh, it is very possible that Matthew, writing to a Jewish Christian audience, Mark writing to a Gentile Christian audience primarily, but Matthew writing to a Christian Jewish audience did not uh, want to convey to them that all foods were clean for them. Yes, maybe all foods are clean for Gentiles, but all foods are not clean still for Jewish Christians. Now, this is a little bit speculative because we don't know that Matthew was using the precise version of Mark that has that parenthetical comment. Maybe Matthew was using a version of Mark before that parenthetical comment uh, was added. And so it's a little bit speculative. But, um, you know, it would in general fit with Matthew as the most Jewish gospel that he would omit that uh, statement in Mark about all foods being clean if he was writing to a Jewish Christian audience. I doubt extremely seriously whether or not the Jewish Christians of the late first century believed that all foods were clean for them, even if even if Gentiles were able uh, to eat all foods. And so um, this, this branch of New Testament studies that looks at how the Gospel writers have possibly edited their sources as a reflection of their theology gets at truth um, because it, it gets at, at, at part of the thought world of Matthew. It tells us truths uh, from Matthew. Again, the older the older fundamentalist drive, yeah, but it's all about history. Well, isn't it all about truth? And history is a vehicle of truth, but there are other vehicles of truth. The parable of the prodigal son, Jesus, there's, we have no reason to believe that the parable of the good Samaritan actually happened in history. It's a story. It's a, it's a fiction in terms of genre. Is it true? Absolutely. Incredible, potent truths. It's just not historical. And so uh, this is an important paradigm shift if we are to have uh, to move to a mature uh, reading and understanding of the Gospels. And of course, John's Gospel is uh, uh, often called a spiritual gospel. Clement of Alexandria in the 100s uh, called John a spiritual gospel. It may very well be, and of course, uh, John is a historical source. I'm not in any way discounting John as a historical source, but it may very well be that John has moved some things around and paraphrased some things and, and made some things explicit that weren't uh, necessarily clear at the time. Um, the first example that comes to mind is the cleansing of the temple. Of course, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is something Jesus does in the last week on earth. Uh, but John moves it to chapter 2, arguably. Now, it could have happened twice, but when you get into the way sources are used here, it's difficult to, to, to come to that conclusion. It's just the consistent pattern seems to be that the Gospel writers felt free to rearrange things to bring out uh, various points. And so, um, it may very well be that John has brought the cleansing of the temple to chapter 2 uh, to put it next to the, the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine. And of course, what, what are the vats that are used in the turning of water into wine? Uh, they are uh, vats for ceremonial cleansing. Um, John may be symbolically saying that Jesus is the one now that makes things clean um, and that the temple is no longer necessary. Um, and, and so it may very well be that there is a great deal of symbolism um, and paraphrasing um, and, and hindsight is twenty twenty uh, to John's uh, uh, presentation, uh, which um, would answer why there are certain tensions between the way John presents uh, the gospel story and the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke do. But of course, I want to move away from that. That's all kind of FYI, things that a minister should know. Uh, may, maybe a minister doesn't have to know them in depth, but a minister should be aware that those kinds of things um, exist and that that's the way scholars think about uh, the Gospels.
um, the overwhelming majority of, of, of scholars, not hacks, not liberals, not crazies, but experts. That's, that's what experts think about the Gospels. But what's most important from a standpoint of the Bible and Scripture is being able to apply and to hear God speak and to experience God forming us uh, through the Gospel stories and the Gospel narratives. And so how can we learn from the events of the Gospels, the stories of the Gospels. Well, first of all, the nature of cause and effect is the same. The laws of cause and effect are the same now as they ever as they ever were before. Certain actions bring certain results. Certain good actions can bring good results. Certain bad actions and can bring bring bad results. Uh, there are cause effect relationships within the stories of the Gospels that teach us about cause effect relationships in our world uh, today. Of course, narratives often have a climax. This is the high point of the action, it implies importance. And of course, each gospel tells the story in its own way. The climax is different in each of the four gospels. So in Mark, the climax is arguably after Jesus dies on the cross and the centurion says, wow, surely this guy was the son of God. And that is the high climax in, in, in Mark's gospel. In Matthew, there's almost a double climax. Not only is the resurrection a climax, but there is the end climax uh, when uh, Jesus on the mountain in Galilee uh, gives the Great Commission. And so climax implies importance. And again, when you try to harmonize the Gospels, you obliterate all of these distinctions. You, you actually uh, obliterate the teaching of Matthew and the teaching of Mark and the teaching of Luke and the teaching of John when you mix them together together and try to trump them with some supposed historical imposition you make, where you make a fifth gospel that is far more different than any of the gospels than the gospels are different from each other. You have to let each gospel speak on its own terms, and each gospel has its own climax, and that tells you something. And of course, the, the gospels often have turning points. The turning point in the gospel of Mark is where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. and. Um, and, and up to that point, it's been go, 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 heal, do miracles. But after that point, uh, there is a sense of Jaws music, dun, 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 Jesus is headed for the cross, a sense of foreboding, you know what's going to happen. And so these, these aspects of the way uh, the events are told are meaningful, uh, and we can draw points from them uh, in both lessons to learn and um, things to preach. And of course, what is the overall problem that is being solved by the plot? The nature of story is that some unfulfilled goal is moving toward being fulfilled at the end of the story. Of course, in Christian theology, the problem was set up by Adam, where sin entered into the world. And of course, Christ solved the problem, and it will be definitively solved when Christ comes again. That's, of course, the Christian story. Each gospel has its own way of presenting the story. Adam doesn't appear in any of the gospels. That's a Pauline thing. And so when we're reading Mark or Matthew on its own terms, we can't bring Adam into it. We can bring it in in our theology, uh, but we can't bring it in in terms of the interpretation of Matthew itself, because Matthew doesn't doesn't seem to presuppose Adam in any way. But each, each gospel um, is working toward um, a, a sense of what the point is. Um, and so John tells us, uh, gives us a statement of purpose at the end. You know, I've written these things so that you know that Jesus is the Christ. And so we can see that that is the point uh, that John is moving toward uh, throughout. So we can learn from the events of the stories and preach the events of the stories in various ways. We can learn from the characters of the story. So who is like me in the story? What does the story teach me about me? This is the great thing about stories, the great potentially subversive thing about story stories. Uh, you'll remember when Nathan the prophet comes to David and gets David all upset at a certain character in the story and then Nathan Nathan reveals that it's David. David is exactly that that character in the story. Stories have a way of getting through our defense shields, of, of working their way into us and before you know it we, we can see our own hypocrisy and we can see our own needs. Um, of course we have to be careful because we tend to psychologize the stories in terms of our modern psychology. We are very introspective. I talked earlier about us being post-Freudian. We, we have a sense of, 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 of the way people think that is not at all likely uh, to be the way ancient people uh, think. Uh, Joseph and Mary didn't sit down for coffee. They probably didn't even sit in the sleep in the same bed. Um, ancient families, ancient people 
uh, ancient people were group oriented. We are individualists, sometimes hyper individualists. Our sense of, of the way people think is not at all likely uh, to be the way the biblical characters themselves thought. That doesn't mean that you can't psychologize the story. In fact, some of the best and most poignant parts of a sermon are where you, you put yourself into the heads of the characters and talk to your congregation uh, about, about those kinds of thinking. Just it's important to be aware that at those points you're probably not, you've, you've left the story in terms of its original meaning and you're now dancing with the spirit in terms of a, a, an applicational meaning. And I think quite often the characters in biblical stories tend to be flat. Um, we, we've seen so many movies, I mean even, even the old Hitchcock movies sometimes seem very flat um, because we have such a high um, capacity for characterization. Um, after taking courses in psychology in college and after seeing so many movies. And so sometimes the, the characters in the biblical stories may seem a little bit uh, flat. Um, and of course we bring them to life by, by imposing our modern psychologi psychologization upon them. Um, this is just something to be aware of. Uh, I'm not in any way telling you not uh, to dance with the spirit um, and dance with the characters um, in a way that, that brings it to life in, in terms of our issues and our times and what God might say to us today uh, through these characters. I'm just wanting you to be aware of that distinction. And of course we can learn from the settings. What aspects of the situation in the story are similar uh, to mine? Um, what, uh, do I need to find a place or time like that of the text? Do I have holy ground in my life? Do I have holy time, sacred time in my life? Um, am I in, do I need to leave a place that I'm in? Maybe I need to flee bad places and bad times. Maybe I'm putting myself in a location that makes me susceptible to temptation, just like David put himself in a situation or found himself in a situation of temptation. Where, what settings should I seek? What settings should I flee? What should I do in certain settings? What should I not do in certain settings? And of course, how is my world, how is my context similar or different from the world of the text? There's a danger with simply applying the text blindly to today because uh, doing things that they did isn't always doing the same thing in our world because the meaning is different in a different context. And of course, evaluative point of view is important. Uh, because each story is told from a certain perspective. Job, I think, is the best example uh, because uh, Job's comforters give him a bad point of view and you wouldn't want to preach uh, the, the point of view of Job's comforters without bringing in uh, the critique of them. So, for example, Job brings some critique of, of his comforters. He knows more about God's point of view than they do. But at the end of the book, of course, God comes in and shows that even Job's uh, point of view was somewhat defective. And so even Job's point of view earlier in the story has to be uh, brought within the purview of God's point of view at the end. And then, of course, where does the author's understanding of God's point of view fit in the flow of Revelation? God incarnated truth uh, in terms that that fit and spoke to the audiences of each time and place. So the author of Job, um, God spoke to Job in the categories of Job's day. And Job doesn't understand either God or the problem of evil uh, as well as the New Testament does. And so even the, even the evaluative point of view of Job has to be brought into uh, contact with the New Testament uh, point of view. And then, of course, lastly, it's important to remember that their story is my story. I, let me go to the second point first. That Israel was the people of God just as I am part of the people of God and the New Testament Christians were the were the people of God just as I am the people of God. Their story is my story. I'm just in a different part of the plot and that puts me in continuity with the Bible. Uh, but number one, there is a difference between the stories in the text and the text as part of God's story. The pre-modern puts themselves into the biblical uh, stories and, and, and makes the biblical stories into straightforward history. Um, a reflective uh, point of view realizes that each of the biblical texts are themselves part of God's story, that Matthew is part of the story of God walking with his people. Genesis is part of God walking uh, with God's people. The pre-modern tends to, to create a story out of the biblical text um, and, and that's not, I'm not saying that's a, a, a wrong thing to do. You can definitely 
apply that story. But um, a more uh, mature understanding of Scripture not only can see that, but, but can see the individual stories of Scripture as part of a bigger story of history of God walking with the people of God. And because I am the people of God, then the stories of how Matthew spoke to, to early Christians, how Genesis spoke to Israel, that story um, is part of my story as well, because I am in the people of God, just as they were in the people of God.